Welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a very nice break and got some uh, body movement or some coffee or water or whatever you needed. Uh, now it's time to continue uh, with more presentations. Before we I think that's enough. So let's move uh, on to the three presentations for this time slot before the lunch. We will start with Justin Schneiderman and Andreas Fager. I will introduce these two guys in a second. Then we also have a presentation by Joran Bergström and Fredrik Kahl and Michel Scholl and Dave, David Fellmar before uh, we get to have a lunch break. And as I said, in between these talks, we will also launch a few questions, quiz questions. If you have questions to our speakers, please use the YouTube chat. It's forwarded to us here on the stage, uh, as well as if you send questions through email uh, at the email address that you see or the phone number that you see. Now it's more than time to uh, introduce our next speakers. It's uh, Dr. Justin Schneiderman from uh, uh, Sorgenska Academy. He is associate professor there at the University of Gothenburg. And we have Dr. Andreas Fager, also associate professor, but at the Department of Electrical Engineering here at Chalmers. And both of these uh, speakers are also affiliated with MetaQuest. Um, Justin and Andreas will talk about a new exciting uh, facility that is currently being built within uh, the Salgenska University Hospital. Uh, I will not ruin their title, so I will just uh, hand over the word to Andreas and Justin. Very welcome. Thank you very much. <coughs> I hope you can hear us. Very so, as you have introduced us, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, we will present the Shiedel Lab for Clinical Research that we are currently involved in designing, building and constructing inside of the Boyk building in, in Sahlgrenska University Hospital. Let's see if I can move forward. The idea with this um, research lab is that it's located inside the hospital. It's inside the most advanced part of the hospital, the Imaging and Intervention Center, uh, and it will be a part of the Department of Radiology. The planned opening of this lab will be August 2021, and we have currently started uh, the construction work on site. So that will go on during the spring and the summer. This is a project that is initiated and uh, led by MedTech West. It's funded by the European Union and Tilvexverket in a grant, but it also brings together um, uh, Region Vestra Götaland, Chalmers, University of Gothenburg, and this uh, the Sorgens Academy, and also University of Borås uh, as a member of Metec West. Uh, so this is a joint project where we um, will be able to conduct research, and we will talk today about microwave and MEG research that we can do in this lab. So this lab is located, as I said, Department of Radi Radiology. So it's right in the heart of the hospital. If you look at this map, maybe it's not so, uh, so easy to understand anything from the map, but what you can realize here is that the main entrance of the hospital is uh, somewhere here, and there's the hallway and corridor down straight ahead from the main entrance. And just when you come to the back wall here you can say turn a little bit right and here we have the lab at the main or, or at the entrance of this radiology department here it's ground floor and the boyk building so we have a really nice location here these are the rooms our treatment rooms and regular uh, rooms used in the hospital care uh, so we are have access here to a very nice facility and what is this lab going to be about? Well, it's a shielded room. You can see a CAD drawing of it here. You can see a floor plan here. And there'll be a equipment room. There'll be a treatment room or examination and, uh, for the patient. And we have some changing areas for the patient. And there will be a, a computer station and workplace here where everything can be controlled. 
I said it's a shielded room. It's actually a double shielded room. And what does it mean? Well, it means that um, it's magnetically and electrically shielded. So there's a shield here, RF shielding, electrical shielding, and there's a magnetical shield here. So inside here, here the magnetic and electrical shielding, the patient can be treated or examined. And there are two purposes for this shielding. One is we don't want to get disturbed by, by uh, whatever goes on around this room. And also we don't want to disturb other uh, parts of the building with, with the electromagnetic waves that might uh, be transferred from our experiments. So we have a shielded environment where we can do our experiments. And we will talk more about exactly what kind of experiments and what kind of research we will do in this lab. So but I leave the word to Justin. No. Thank you, Andreas. So uh, as one might imagine, uh, one cannot simply move into the hospital and start uh, doing experiments. So there's a lot of administrative support that's required in order to safely and uh, effectively implement new research activities in this uh, high technology um, healthcare facility. So MedTech West uh, and the Innova Kunz platform have worked together to start a project that will deal with organizing all of the management routines and, and other routines for uh, basically coordinating the types of research and clinical activities that will be going on in this lab. So that includes um, routines and support for interaction of the trifecta of healthcare, industry, and research. Also support systems for the clinical research itself, as well as uh, for access and, and allocation of, of new research experiments and new uh, clinical uh, applications. And of course, involved or sort of maintaining a, an innovation system in order to deal with new uh, innovative ideas that might be uh, utilized in the future. And all of this structure is set up so that the allocation of the use of the lab is fair, safe, and works properly together with the surrounding clinical activities. So it's important to, to note, as, as Andreas pointed out, we're sitting in the uh, radiology department of the hospital. And that means patients are gonna be constantly coming in and out of this area uh, in our lab, but also in other care facilities within the Image and Intervention Center at the Sagrensky University Hospital. So, uh, it takes quite a lot of work to coordinate how all of these activities are going to be synchronized and, and working properly together. So that's what this next activity or this uh, management structure is going to be all about. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so as Andreas mentioned, we'll also be doing a lot of research and uh, my research emphasis is in squids uh, and biomagnetism. So squids are superconducting sensors and they're fabricated over at the Chalmers uh, Department of Microtechnology and Nanoscience in the clean room facilities there. And we use these squids for studying magnetic fields generated by biological systems. And one of those uh, systems that we look at is the brain, in fact. So magnetoencephalography or MEG is a technique with which you uh, detect the electrical activity in the brain with good spatial resolution, so something on the order of one centimeter, and unsurpassed temporal resolution. So we can see brain signals up into the kilohertz or millisecond uh, time frame. Today, it's mostly used in cognitive neuroscience research and neurophysiology and psychiatry, as well as trying to understand uh, diseases and disorders in the brain, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Clinically, today, MEG is used chiefly for epilepsy surgery planning, that is to localize the epileptic, epileptogenic zone that should be removed in order to allow a patient to be uh, seizure free, but also in general for pre-surgical mapping when, for example, a tum tumor must be removed in order to understand what parts of the brain need to be spared or, or uh, worked around in order not to damage any critical functions like language, sensory uh, areas, and, and motor areas. However, today's MEG technology is limited, and that limitation is basically uh, due to the fact that the sensors that are used are uh, what are called low TC squids, so low temperature squids. Because of these uh, extreme cooling that these sensors require, 
the systems today look uh, like what you see over there on the right hand side of the screen. So there's a very large construction sitting above this subject's head and a helmet shaped uh, essentially a doer that houses these uh, very cold sensors. Uh, and <clears throat> because of that, uh, signal to noise ratio ratios and resolution are limited. But also these systems, as you might imagine, are extremely expensive to run. And I should point out that the, the sort of surroundings you see there with the, the doorway in the right and, and opening on the left hand side of that uh, system there are actually the magnetic shielding that any MEG system requires. And that's what we're putting into uh, BOIC. So the idea we have had is to develop a new sensor technology for uh, MEG. And that is to say we use high TC or high temperature superconducting materials for our sensors. And that means uh, because of the relaxed cooling requirements, these sensors can in fact flexibly be placed at the scalp surface or within roughly one millimeter of the scalp. So there in the middle, you see the first prototype system we constructed. It has seven high TC squids on it. You can see that um, it's about 70 centimeters long. So it's much smaller than the conventional MEG systems of the state of the art. We have also been working uh, on building a 21 channel system. The cryostat is already done and we are going, going to be populating it with sensors in the next year or so. And uh, just as I mentioned before, the, as a comparison, you can see on the, the bottom left hand side, our system is there uh, sampling one of our collaborator, Daniel Lundquist's uh, somatosensory area in his brain. There you can see on the right hand side, or sorry, on the bottom left, inflated brain views of the increased sensitivity to that particular region of the brain when we place the cryostat where it is. Uh, so on the very far left, the light blue brain you see is the one that is sampled with the low TC system. So the conventional MEG system that you see sort of in the helmet shaped construction sitting behind Daniel. There you see uh, good uh, homogeneity of the sensitivity, but fairly low values of information or amount of information that can be extracted from the brain in particular on the somatosensory region that is highlighted uh, by the, the arrow there. So our the more gray brain shows uh, very high information capacity coming from the somatosensory area. And uh, in general, it, our systems are also much uh, more cost effective because uh, roughly 80% of the atmosphere is liquid nitrogen. And that means, uh, yeah, cooling the system down is, is incredibly cheap compared to systems that are running on liquid helium, like the state of the art. Those systems uh, run or uh, require roughly half a million crowns per year in helium costs. And because helium is a scarce natural resource, that price is going to continue to increase in the future. Next slide, please. So I mentioned in the beginning that we're, we've been working on biomagnetism. So uh, MEG is one of the main uh, research areas that we investigate, but there's a lot of other applications. So specific to MEG, we've been looking at uh, stress arousal in the fight or flight response in relation to cardiovascular disease together with Miguel Elam and his group. We've also been looking at the neural excitation and inhibition balance with high frequency signals that are coming from the brain, as well as mapping and other uh, research activities. In terms of clinical applications, uh, as mentioned, the stress arousal and fight or flight project has implications to cardiovascular disease. We've also looked at sensory hypersensitivity and autism with Christopher Yilberry and his group at the Neuro, uh, Yilberry Center. Uh, we will be investigating epilepsy with Christina Malmgren and her group at the Sagrensky University Hospital. We hope to include uh, some of Max Ortiz's patients and uh, understanding what's going on in the brain, the plasticity that happens when you have a new prosthesis, and in particular, what happens in the brain. Uh, and in particular, we're going to be, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, biomagnetism specific research area. So we look at, can also use our, our systems to look at the heart. So we can look at uh, magnetocardiography, uh, the, the spine and peripheral nerves with neurography, myography, et cetera, as well as other clinical applications in relation to all of those. But uh, yeah, next slide. So we will, I'd like to just show a nice example of cardiography performed on in utero. So in this case, we had a PH, former PhD student that was pregnant and uh, 31 weeks pregnant at the time of this recording. And she was curious to see if we could in fact detect the heartbeat of her, uh, of her baby. Uh, we had no electrocardiogram running on the mother 
which would have improved the recording because that allows one to remove the heartbeat artifact that comes from the mother's heart. But uh, regardless, we could still see clear R tags from the fetus's uh, heartbeat. So uh, the red stars, as you see, indicate the mother's heartbeat, which is roughly 66 beats per minute, uh, quite normal. And the fetal heartbeat uh, is marked in the, with the black stars, and those are uh, much more rapid, which is typical of, of babies. For those of you that have had a child already, you know that the fetal heartbeat is somewhere around 120 to 150 beats per minute. And so in this case, her fetus was beating along at 130 beats per minute. And this is a, a very nice sort of proof of concept to show that our technology is, of course, uh, targeting magnetoencephalography. So that is looking at brain uh, magnetic fields generated by brain activity, but it can also be used for a lot of interesting clinical and, and research applications. Next slide, please. Of course, all of this work wasn't done just by me. So uh, I have to thank all of my collaborators, including Doug Winkler over at Chalmers, Nikhil Alam here at my Institute of Neuroscience and Physiology, as well as uh, Johan Westbatty, Elena Orekova, and then uh, lots of other students and, and uh, uh, yeah, master's students and PhD students and postdocs in our group, as well as, for example, Daniel Wimpfist, the very tall gentleman you see standing up there on the top right hand side of the screen. He was a subject that you saw for the experiments before. And uh, Martin Ingvar, he and Daniel are responsible for the NATMEG uh, Center over in, at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm that we've been using uh, for over, almost a decade now. Uh, and thanks to them, they brought a lot of expertise. So on the bottom right hand side, uh, on the very right hand side, the gentleman with the purple shirt is probably one of the most well known names in the magnetoencephalography field. Uh, that's uh, Matthew Hamalainen, and there are uh, other experts and, and students as well. So thank you for your time. So I will uh, take over here and present some of the research work that we will do uh, with respect to microwaves. Um, let's see if I can. So of course, I'm not doing this myself either. Um, so I'm the head of the research group in biomedical electromagnetics you see uh, the current group of people involved in this slide so there are 12 people but this is the staff at chalmers and of course we also have several medical collaborators and other uh, but this forms this um, technical part of the microwave development that we are that i'm leading what are we going to do and why do we want to use microwaves? So you can say that what we're trying to do is to an attempt to combine some of the uh, more recent inno innovations and developments in the technology. One is micro components, which is exemplified here by a, a mobile phone, showing that the uh, hardware and the circuits are compact, very small scale, also low cost and easily accessible. We also have access to large computational resources, also in very compact form. Even the uh, computer resources available on a mobile phone or an iPad type of um, uh, platform is enormous compared to only a few years ago. So we're trying to combine these two uh, um, techniques to do clinical research and to solve medical problems. And we, what we are trying to do is to develop, de develop the techniques and systems, both for diagnostics and treatment of major health problems that, can, that today affects large populations globally and also nationally, but where we also see that there is a possibility to improve the situation. When it comes to microwaves and the microwave research that we do, uh, we focus on antenna development, antenna systems development, algorithms and um, miniaturizing these systems. Of course, also, we would like to introduce uh, them into the clinic and uh, into clinical trials. And this is one of the reasons we want to use this shielded lab. We have a platform for that. I will show you some of the examples. And this is only examples uh, of what we have been doing at, and what we plan to do in this lab. So this is um, the technology in this picture here to the right, the MD100 that we 
are involved in developing together with the company Medfield Diagnostics. The intention is to use this for stroke and trauma diagnostics. And the point to, to do that is to do that on the field, in the ambulance or at the home of a patient. Because if you have a stroke or a, a trauma bleeding, the most important factor for a successful treatment is time. Today, these patients have to be transported to hospitals for diagnosis and treatment. But with the possibility to diagnose already at the, in the ambulance, this transportation and decision phase can be spe speeded up. And that would be very beneficial for the patient. So this uh, system and this technique has perhaps come the furthest or it has come, this techno technique we have come the furthest in the development. We are involved together with Medfield in clinical trials in several countries, Sweden, Norway, Australia, and there might be a few more coming up as well. So this is an example of what we can develop further in this lab. Another example is where microwaves have great potential to improve the situation is in breast cancer imaging particularly in the so-called dense breast, where the amount of fibroglandular tissues is large. There's x-ray mammography that is used today have a challenge to actually see the tumors immersed in the fibroglandular tissue. So microwave system, uh, the sketch to the left here, see the woman lying down on the bed with a breast pendant into a tank with the antennas and uh, it contains also a matching liquid. To the right here, you see the clinical prototype that we are currently constructing. You see the black uh, spot, uh, points here, which are the end, ends of the antennas, and there's a green bottle, which uh, represents a, a phantom object. So this system will sit under the table and measure the breasts. The point is to do imaging, um, to get images to look at and see if there are tumors. So at the moment we are building this clinical prototype. We also have recently developed a PhD student, uh, developed a, a very fast algorithm for almost real time image reconstruction. This is one of the challenges when, when it comes to imaging applications, that's the reconstruction time. Accuracy, of course, and resolution, but also reconstruction time. So with this new development, much of that problem will have been solved. We're also going to use this lab for uh, hyperthermia treatment experiments or clinical trials. And then it deals with tumors in head and neck and also children's brain cancer tumors. So here is the Pro, um, prototype for that. To the left, you see the antenna system, antenna array, um, and to the right, you see it applied to uh, one of, uh, or to Hannah, who is leading this effort. Um, the, the purpose here is to heat the tumor and to keep it heated for an hour or one, half, one and a half an hour um, at a time. And we want to heat the tumor to, say, 44, 40 to 44 degrees. And by doing this repeatedly, the cure rate of the cancer tumors can be improved quite dramatically if it, this technique is combined with uh, conventional technology. So there's a growing evidence in the literature of studies showing that hypothermia combined with traditional treatment is actually working pretty well. The challenge is, of course, to focus the energy into the tumor and not heat the healthy tissue surrounding the tumor. Another challenge is to check or to monitor that uh, the temperature increases sufficiently and that it's maintained at a sufficient temperature. As you might know, also the body is an extremely efficient cooling system. Uh, so it, as soon as it senses that anything is heating, for example, if you go out running and get a little bit um, sweaty in the, in the forehead, we, we can, well, it's the body's coolest cooling system that starts to work. So we have to fight against it. 
And for this, we need really high powers. And this is one of the uh, reasons this RF shielded room is needed. We don't want to disturb anything around this with this uh, high energy microwave pulses or waves that we want to propagate into the body. Another example is uh, muscle uh, rupture diagnostics. Um, bleedings in particularly in athletes or even you and I when we go out running and we might suffer muscle rupture. These are usually diagnosed with MRI and of course uh, athletes in the top leagues, top clubs um, get MRI if they need it but quite uh, not so far down into the league sorry not to mention you and I and exercising public or um, youth leagues etc they don't and we don't get access to these MRI exams that easily it's too costly simply so here is an example to the lower left here of an antenna system which we intend to use for imaging in the same way as of the breast but here adapted to imaging of the thigh uh, front and back of the thigh and the purpose here is to locate bleedings that is a sign of a muscle rupture there's also a need to monitor healing of muscles uh, today it's basically a big guesswork if if you hear that slatan gets injured and he is uh, getting rehabilitation and he's going to going back to um, to competing again within certain numbers of weeks or a month it's basically a, a guesswork based on experience there's no way today to to monitor the strength of the muscle or to monitor how it's healing it cannot be seen in MRI. So this is one of the research questions we would like to target here to see if it's with the microwaves, it's possible to target, uh, to monitor, for example, formation of scar tissues and, uh, and the healing and the strengthening of the muscle. So that is a summary of, of the different projects um, or initial projects that we plan to um, conduct clinical research on in this lab. Of course, this is a start um, and we can see, of course, that many more applications would um, develop out of this. It's also a, actually a reach out that uh, we want to fill this room with activities. So if you see that this room could be useful to you or that you see a way to collaborate on these kind of projects, uh, as Justin mentioned, there's a, will be, we will build up a administrative routine around this lab so there will be possibilities for also other users to to get access and to use this facility for in in the research work so that is my last slide thank you very much for listening thank you very much uh, justin and andreas uh, it was very exciting to see all the advanced technology that that you're already working with and developing and that can be placed in in uh, the upcoming lab or research facility within Solvianska. So we're really looking forward to more exciting research here. Uh, I'm afraid that time is up for, for uh, questions, but if you have the time, please stay on Zoom and we may come back to questions uh, towards the lunch break if, if that has come uh, from the audience. So I, by that, I would like to thank you now and we should introduce uh, our quiz questions. Um, so I hope that all of you have uh, joined Kahoot and signed up for uh, the code. I can repeat it again if you don't have it. I, I heard before that it was very few people signed up. So it's Thank a great you, Martin. chance that you can win the So I hope the uh, quiz participants will feel excited and stimulated throughout the rest of the morning here. Uh, our next uh, speakers will present the interesting topic of building a lasting collaboration for engineering health. And uh, this touches more on our topic of uh, being able to meet, collaborate, discuss, and hopefully lift ourselves from beyond our existing knowledge into something that can take us further. So I would like to welcome Joran Bergström, who is professor and chief physician at Salgrenska Academy, alongside Fredrik Kahl, who is professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering at Chalmers. Welcome, both of you. Yeah. Let's see, can, I, can we make sure that we can hear you? 
Thank you. <laughs> All right, good. If you can hear me, yes. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. So with no further ado, go ahead and tell us about this collaboration. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and also thank you for the organizers for organizing this excellent seminar and inviting me and Freddy to give a talk about uh, <clears throat> our collaboration. And we have, we met in 2014 and have collaborated in in the health engineering sector, or more specifically in image analysis in the last five, six years. And we will try to give you our views on, on uh, what actually makes that collaboration successful and how to make it run uh, smoothly. So I will start giving some uh, experience from the biomedical side and then Frederick will give his views from the computer vision side. <clears throat> and I'm sorry for my voice here today that is a bit strained but i hope you can listen uh, hear what i'm saying so if i can have the second slide please uh, so Freddie and i met in 2014 and the reason was to discuss a potential collaboration around this project the scarpis project uh, and since this is the main focus of our collaboration and since scarpis hopefully can also be used in other health engineering projects, I will give you some background on where we currently are with this project. So if you look at the lower right of the screen, you see the acronym of SCARPIS. Uh, it says that it's a population-based study uh, that uh, cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary uh, bioimaging studies. It's cardiovascular and pulmonary, and there's a lot of imaging in this uh, study. Like that's the trademark of the study, you could say. And we've invited more than 30,000 participants and they've all been recruited uh, to a, a very comprehensive examination. And on the left side there on the list, you can see the, the details of that examination. And the main sort of attraction of the study was the, the imaging, which was done using a computer tomography scanner. Uh, and you can see the scout of the scanner on the left and you see also what we focused on. So we have images of the heart, several aspects of the heart, the lungs, and also uh, very importantly in cardiovascular research, uh, the different fat depots throughout the body. So we can actually measure how much fat is stored in different places. Uh, so it's, a, and then in addition to the imaging, we've also done a lot of other more traditional epidemiological measurements. Uh, you can see them on the list. We have biobank blood and we will follow these individuals into the future via the excellent Swedish registries. Uh, but this collaboration is about imaging. So I tried to summarize in the lower left sort of the, the amount of images that we actually have stored in this project. And it's quite a lot. Uh, so we definitely and those images are now being transferred to Göteborg and the database is being built at the Göteborg University to host the images and then be able to share them among researchers. Uh, so we have a lot of imaging and we ne definitely need help to extract information from those images. And if I just can have one click, uh, this is something that is very important for us. We just opened, or a few weeks ago, we opened this resource for applications. So we have stored all the information in a database. Uh, and if you're a researcher at a Swedish university or, or, um, uh, or the like, you can apply for data from this resource. And please visit scopis.org and, and read more about the details on how you can do that. Uh, so let's switch to the next slide. So the uh, fo focus on our imaging is to try to visualize where in the disease process you can find each individual. So from left to right here in the image, on the left side you have more of risk factor accumulation, you have different fat depots, you have fat around the heart, abdominal fat, and moving to the right you have liver fat and then you have we also image the actual disease you can see cardiac uh, um, uh, calcifications and a cardio uh, coronary vessel angiogram in the middle and we actually look at atherosclerosis and build up of plaques in these vessels so by doing this comprehensive imaging we want to stage each individual where they are in the disease process and learn more about that of course uh, next slide uh, and another way of using this large image material is to try to improve prediction of uh, future cardiovascular disease. 
and this is my own uh, field of interest uh, that I'm working with. So what we want to do is to identify people that are in the highest risk of having a future near in near time future cardiovascular event and of course we want to get them if we can do that we want to focus our prevention efforts to these individuals and traditionally the the upper arrow in the image that has been done by measuring like cholesterol blood pressure questions about smoking diabetes and so on and then building a risk score from that and that's that's pretty helpful but only rather only at the population level, not so helpful for each individual because it's too unprecise. There are too many events in the low risk population and still uh, people at high risk do not always develop events. So that needs to be improved. And my hope and Scarpi's hope is that this can be done by adding imaging to these, um, these risk scores. For example, if you have disease in your vessels and a high risk score, that combination might might even lead to an individualized uh, risk scores in the future. So we have a lot of questions around these images and that's why I made contact with Frederick to get help to extract information from these images. So the next slide. Uh, Frederick and I met in 2014. We published our first paper on a fat that surrounds the heart in 2016 and we're now collaborating on a number of projects. Uh, may, most of these projects, imaging, image analysis projects are within the SCARPIS project. And this has been a very good, fruitful collaboration and we have some really, I think we have in the next coming years, we have some really interesting things coming out. Uh, but we also had some trials and tribulations in our collaboration that, that, that could have been mainly on my side, perhaps having a bit of the wrong expectation of the sort of nature and, and interests in Friedrich research and what is really important for him to be successful. Uh, I think now we've sort of sorted that out and we really have a very effective way to collaborate now. So I will try to give you some ideas of, on what that might be in the next slide. Uh, so here I try to summarize the, the skills, needs and interests on our two sides. And of course we need to balance this to develop a really good collaboration. And on my side, the biomedical researcher, I want access to detailed extracted information from large sets of image data like the SCOPY study, 30,000 image sets. I have skills in biology and I can generate and interpret medical image data. I'm perhaps not really interested in the image itself. I want extracted tabulated data from the images. Is this disease and how much disease and so on. On the other hand, Frederick is, he's interested in the actual extraction of information. Now, Frederick has to give his take on this as well uh, when, he, when he, he talks, but this is my, my view of it. And he wants to find novel solutions for extracting data from images, which of course is his expertise. Uh, he wants large sets of data uh, or very detailed annotations of these data and then he can sort of settle with fewer cases. And what I realized uh, uh, is once the problem with extracting information is solved, then, then sort of Friedrich, Friedrich's research aim has been reached. Uh, and there are no really technical resources at the Chalmers side or at Friedrich's side to then repeat this analysis on 30,000 other uh, participants in SCOPIS. So this scaling and implementation of the techniques that are coming from Frederick, that it's something that, that I need to push and drive on my side. So the last slide. Uh, so after building experience over the years, this is the way we've organized our workflow and to try to, to optimize both our interests and skills. Uh, and this is the workflow that we're now using so uh, at Salgranska, we generate images. We also annotate these images with the expert that we have on our side. And then we direct Frederick's interest to the interesting parts of the image and the information that we actually want to retrieve and want to do research on. And then it's trying to Frederick to do his tricks with the actual training, development of precision models and networks to extract the information that we agreed upon is interesting. And then he's refining these models. They are very uh, competitive and really uh, cutting edge uh, models. And once we have the model, 
we lock the model and then we need to scale it and implement it. And then I need to kick in again to make this also possible to use in, in uh, the whole Scarpis population. Uh, so I need to, what I've actually done is to hire engineering help uh, to do this scaling and to run this at, at a large scale, which is not a trivial task, but it's it's more of an engineering task than a research task. So, so it, it, it's something that you can actually hire to do. So now, the, I'll really, it's a great collaboration. It's working nicely, and we have several things that will come the next few years. Uh, so I think I've finished my part of the presentation there, and let Frederick continue. Thanks. Wonderful. Do we have Frederick with us? Yes, I'm here. Ah, Let's see. There we go. Hello. Where is my... I'll be like that. Let's see. All right. I assume you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. I will uh, continue on the topic of... Uh, building a lasting collaboration for engineering help. Um, this will not be a technical talk. I will, but instead I'll share my uh, personal experience on uh, working with the, or, or collaborating with the medical researchers. So I thought I'll start with uh, saying a few words about myself. So I did my PhD thesis at Lund University. Then I spent a couple of years abroad and then I came to Chalmers in 2014. Oh, sorry, I'm getting sun here suddenly. Oh, that's better. And uh, all right. So uh, one of the first things I did when I uh, came to Chalmers was to hire a new PhD student, uh, Jennifer Alvien, to work on uh, medical applications. All right, so my field of research, as Jana said, is computer visions to make computers see. So it's about designing algorithms that can automatically interpret, it, interpret images, images, ordinary images like these. But it, the same methodology also applies to medical images. So back in 2014, when I uh, met uh, Jaran uh, through Mentec West, uh, Jaran introduced me to uh, Scopis. Uh, yeah, we have heard a lot about it. The 30,000 uh, images of uh, human subjects. And uh, the goal was to study or to find new image-based biomarkers for cardiac risk assessment. Uh, so, uh, and the first thing we wanted to do is to measure epicardial fat. So epicardial fat is inside the pericardium, the heart sac. And I still find it quite difficult to see the pericardium. It's just a thin layer on this CT image. I will show you in the next slide where it is. Um, so, but this, this sort of project is fulfilled a number of criteria here. It's, I mean, it's very exciting topic, very impactful on uh, predicting cardiac cardiac infarction and such things. Uh, we had a very dedicated medical partner. There were lots of data. And it was also a technical challenge. This was not a trivial thing to solve. So we got out, off to a flying start, I think. So Jennifer and I and some other colleagues, we developed uh, tools for uh, automatically uh, measure or segmenting the pericardium. You can see it here. Uh, we also generalized this to other settings so we could do full body CT segmentations, getting different organs and the skeleton, etc. And we had a number of joint publications uh, back then. So this was, a, I mean, it's a very good project. So we had, I can make a few observations of that. W when we started, uh, there were really no good tools for anonymization and data sharing and uh, annotation. Uh, for I remember, for instance, we got a hard drive from uh, Jaran with a thousand CT images from Scopis, and we had to anonymize them ourselves, which was not ideal, I think. But yeah, right. I'll, 
Uh, and then annotation, I mean, making the ground truth for these images takes a lot of time. And uh, yeah, I've also realized that medical researchers compared to Chalmers research perhaps have other duties like clinical duties that may sort of cause delays and things like that. All right. Uh, so one thing we learned is to uh, that the infrastructure needed for this is very important. So we build up this workflow or platform. It's a, a tool that you can use in an ordinary web browser. You can upload images and you can set up and uh, annotate your images and train an AI algorithm to do the segmentation and you can correct, etc. So you can do this sort of full workflow that Yaran also showed. So now this tool is available and there are a lot of people using it. Here are some of the users of that. The details are not that important here. Uh, and we have, over the years, we've really built up a large database of uh, annotated examples that we can, uh, well, that our machines can learn anat anatomy on. So, all right. Okay, so uh, the epicardial fat was sort of our initial project. And then we were interested in looking at other things like coronary arteries. So in 2018, we started a master thesis project on that uh, by Fredrik Ring. And at the time we were, we had 25 annotated examples from Scalpus. We were hoping to get more, but I mean, that was enough for a thesis project, but waiting for more data, come, but uh, it didn't, uh, well, it took longer time than expected and Jennifer had to, I mean, she had to, I mean, with a PhD, you have limited time. So she went on to other projects. And about a year ago, she uh, completed her PhD thesis. Uh, so, uh, so that project really didn't take off. But, and then in this year, 2021, we now have 600 annotated examples available, which is great news, um, of course. And another good news is that Jennifer didn't go off to industry or anything like that. She started as a postdoc at Solgrenska with the Jaran Scoop and Ola Jelmgren. Another good news is that I got an opportunity to hire a new PhD student that has started at Chalmers and will be part of the new PhD school to work on this, to continue this collaboration. All right. So this project is continuing, good. All right, so some conclusions here. So one, one has to balance skills, needs and interests. And I also think the time scales, one has to think about that when one does the planning. Another thing, uh, an important lesson that I've learned is that when a medical researcher says, uh, I have a data set of 25 to 30 annotated examples, and this is really big. But in my world, or in the machine learning world, it's not really that big. But it has also inspired me to develop new methods that learn from few example. And uh, that's something we're going to continue from the technical perspective. All right, I think platforms and infrastructures are important to facilitate collaborations. I mentioned this medical platform that we built up, Recomia. I think the new PhD school uh, with the dual PhD students will be another important tool for facilitating research. And uh, my affiliation with MedTech West has, uh, I mean, it has been instrumental to my uh, medical projects. So with that, uh, I'm, uh, I'm done, thank you. Thank you very much, Fredrik and Jöran, for telling us about this. Uh, we are running a bit of a tight schedule, so uh, we may have to handle incoming questions a bit later, possibly right before lunch. Uh, but as it is now, uh, audience, you are still free to send in questions. But if we don't have time to take care of them, we will try to 
uh, address them on the web page if and possible. Speakers, so, yes, I actually do have one for Jaran and Fredrik, and uh, this regards the Scapis uh, data set, of course, and uh, I was wondering if it is being used in education at all, because it seems to me that not only is it good for training machine learning algorithms, but possibly also physicians in recognizing a trajectory towards cardiovascular disease. So is that happening? <clears throat> Not at the moment, but it's a good, uh, it's a good suggestion. <laughs> uh, now, um, I wonder if this could perhaps, uh, we can have some radiologist comment on, David's comment on this perhaps, but the images are mainly there for research. Of course, some of the coronary findings could be very valuable and a very rare finding since we screened 30,000 subjects. We have some vessels that are running very rare projections and so on. So, so that part we've actually discussed to use as an educational bank of images. But uh, so it's a good suggestion. Yeah. Mm. I'm also curious, how long did it take to screen all these 30,000 people? Uh, well, you can do the maths. It's eight per day. And we had six sites that were running full time for three years. So three, four years and we were completed to do this. So it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a major undertaking. Well done. No, sounds very <laughs> somewhat exhausting, but also very valuable, of course. <laughs> Andreas, uh, I also have a question to you, uh, or maybe several, but at least uh, starting with one uh, in sake of time. So I'm really curious about this uh, breast cancer imaging with the microwave technology. So what are the key benefits compared to uh, mammography or mast sometimes called mastography, if I understand it correctly. What is it that you gain with this new technology? I think you mentioned it uh, a little bit, but if you can elaborate. So uh, uh, there are a few advantages with the microwave technique. First of all, it's a non-ionizing method. So it will be completely safe. And even if uh, regular mammography uses very low doses of ionizing radiation, it's still ionizing radiation, and there's a potential risk involved there. We also see that regular mammography has problems in seeing tumors, in particularly in dense breasts. That's breasts with large amounts of uh, fibroglandular tissue, glands and ducts. So the tumors tend to hide between the glands, you can say. And this is uh, um, related to the physics of the material. So the contrast level is much lower um, in the X-ray regime than uh, for microwaves. So there are some studies showing that in microwave re uh, in the microwave regime, uh, the contrast will be much higher. Okay, cool. So how far have you come with this research now? In what stage, if if you can? So at the moment, we are actually planning and uh, writing on a clinical. Uh, research or a clinical application to ethical and uh, medical product agency to to get approval to run a small clinical trial. So we have built and are finishing a, a clinical prototype. We had a PhD student who just a couple of months ago finished and she developed an algorithm, which is also a new step towards these type of reconstructions, which is and the uh, advantage with that method is it's much, much faster than what we have seen before. Uh, okay, yeah, so, that sounds can sounds reconstruct very... an image in a few seconds instead of several minutes or maybe even hours. Oh, uh, at the rooms to that sounds, sounds very imp impressive and also very useful, of course. Uh, so, best of luck with, with that application and with the upcoming clinical trials. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. We really appreciated your efforts and your timekeeping and your interesting uh, presentations. Uh, thank you so much for enlightening us this morning. Yeah, so it has become time for a lunch break now, and uh, we will take, well, 50 eight minutes for it. So uh, welcome back here at uh, 1300 hours. And uh, then we will kick off part two of this uh, two day seminar, which is about modern treatment, personalized health and self care. And our opening speaker there will be Professor Minna Pikkarainen, who is a very new recruit to Chalmers. So don't miss that. But now have a really nice lunch break. See you in an hour. See you in a bit. <laughs>